I think we're long overdue for a Linux video and what AMD has been working on, I think for Linux people and open source people in general is really exciting. Let's take a look. I'm Wendell and this is level one. You should totally subscribe and hit the bell and do all that stuff because the algorithm demands it. The 2000 series Ryzen desktop CPUs have launched and I've been stuck in kind of a quagmire working on Ryzen 5 plus Vega. Ryzen 5 plus Vega on Linux, not ready yet. Let me just summarize it for you there. But the 2000 series desktop CPUs, uh, those are a refresh and those are actually really awesome for open source people. I've had the um, Ryzen 7 2700X and the Ryzen 5 2600X, that's the eight core and the six core, sort of mainstream desktop parts from AMD for about a week now. And I've been testing on Fedora 27, I've been testing with kernel 4.15, 4.16, and 4.17, sort of the release candidate. And I'm happy to report basically everything works. A lot of the new features on the X470 chipset, at least the advertised ones from AMD, things like Store MI and some of the other some of the other features, not really going to be applicable for Linux people. It's, it's kind. Of, I mean, it sounds like a downside, but it's really not. I mean, Store MI lets you have tiered storage. You can do that in software on Linux already. Uh, their software solution for Windows is not portable. It's also still true that things like the 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 motherboard-based NVMe RAID, like we saw in Threadripper, that has come to the 470 chipset. But again, because it's kind of a software-based RAID, uh, you can already do that with Linux. So you don't really need it. You can do that with, with MD, and MD actually does that perfectly competently. Now, in terms of like chipset changes or chipset layout changes or anything like that, the X470 chipset is an incremental improvement over the X370 chipset, but it doesn't really give much to Linux users. Um, it's, it's really not a lot of, a lot of a change for, for Linux users. Uh, for IOMMU, for example, all of the uh, stuff that hangs off of that promontory chipset, the X470 chipset, is still grouped together in one IOMMU group. So what your motherboard vendor chooses to put on the chipset, usually USB, maybe auxiliary, like auxiliary USB controllers, auxiliary SATA controllers, the sound card networking, things like that are hanging off that, that promontory chipset. And then whatever you're using in the sort of secondary PCI Express slots. So for my testing, I've been using the MSI M7 ACK and the Crosshair Hero 7. For our IOMMU groups on the Crosshair Hero 7, we're talking about an IOMMU group for everything that's not connected to the chipset, which is awesome. I am so glad that ASUS did that. So I've got an IOMMU group for my graphics card. I've got an IOMMU group for my third M.2 that's on a PCI Express adapter, my, my, my other PCI Express by four peripheral. I was just using that as a stand-in peripheral. I've got separate groups for both of my uh, NVMe uh, cards, my NVMe uh, flash drives that are on the motherboard, and then everything on the promontory chipset, including my serial attached SCSI adapter, is in its own group. So not really a lot has changed. Everything that's plugged into the chipset is in one group. So that's, that's pretty much the same situation that it was on the X370 chipset. Uh, the only thing that's different here, at least on the Crosshair Hero 7, is they're giving you some options in terms of how they're juggling PCI Express lanes. And so far, I haven't seen that on any motherboard for uh, X470 other than the ASUS Crosshair Hero 7, which is why I'm kind of excited about it. Now, in terms of like UEFI configuration, you can configure UEFI for RAID Expert 2. You can configure uh, UEFI for the P-State override, which is the way that I've been overclocking in Linux so that you don't need a utility. I overclocked my Threadripper system uh, to 4.0 or 4.1 gigahertz. It's 4.1 gigahertz since I got an Intermax cooler on it to keep it cool. And I just did that with P-State overclocking. So I can still get the cool power management thingy that's messing with my clock speed, but I get the full 4.1 gigahertz even when it's under load and it turns into a little space heater in terms of heat production. This out of the box, even though this is a refresh, you know, a second generation CPU, the Linux support is fully there. This motherboard, the sound worked, the networking worked because it's Intel networking. The uh, USB peripherals basically worked. I had a little, like the, the 
The As Media controller sometimes on Linux does some funky stuff, but usually a reboot takes care of it. This motherboard also provides two PCI Express 3.0 adapters. We're gonna do a full review of both this ASUS motherboard and also the MSI M7 ACK. Now I've also tested the M7 ACK with Linux and it's great. It also provides two M.2 slots, one through the chipset and one connected directly to the CPU. You can do RAID with that as well. But again, Linux is gonna be MD RAID. It's not gonna be any of the store MI stuff that Asus has been saying, woo doggies, this thing's amazing. Cause it is pretty neat, but just keep that in mind. The, uh, the M7 is definitely worth a look if you're looking to build a Linux workstation. Basically all of its peripherals work out of the box as well. It's a little different setup, a little different goals and strategies than the Asus Crosshair Hero 7. But I really had to point out exactly what Asus had done with the PCI Express layout on the Crosshair Hero 7 because it is unique. Now in terms of stress testing and all the other stuff, I've run Kill Ryzen, I've done all sorts of terrible things. There don't seem to be any marginality problems this time around. I got a launch day 1800X that we bought and I never had problems with the, the Kill Ryzen script. I never had any of the marginality problems on the CPU that we picked up. So that's not something that affected every CPU, I think. But, you know, on a sample size of two, uh, Kill Ryzen is fine. And I'm also really happy to report that all of the cool stuff, like the built-in boost up to 4.3 gigahertz, all of that seems to work fine on Linux, or pretty close to fine. I've seen it boost as high as 4.225 gigahertz. I don't think I've seen the full 4.3, but in terms of like speeds reported by the CPU frequency GNOME widget thingy, it's basically been fine. Now in terms of ECC support, that's gonna be down to the board vendor. The board vendor has to support ECC and we, you know, it was a little mixed on X370. Some boards supported ECC, some boards explicitly disabled ECC. So with the setup here, you're gonna have to check the level one motherboard reviews in, of the specific motherboard in order to determine does it have ECC support. The CPUs support ECC, but again, it's gonna be up to the board vendor. Now, unfortunately, while the Crosshair Hero 7 supports ECC, or at least ECC works with the motherboard, supports is in quotation marks there, the, the MSI M7 does not support ECC. ECC is disabled in the UEFI. When I enabled uh, SVM, it did not seem to make a difference. So, Crosshair Hero 6, ECC, yes. MSI M7, X470, no. In general, you know, it, it varies a little bit even from, from board to board. So, uh, something, something to check on. One thing about error correcting memory that I will discourage you a little bit on is that with the improvements to the new Zen processor, having faster memory really does help a lot. If you can run 2933 over, you know, 2133 or 2400 or even 2600, you absolutely should do it. It's kind of diminishing returns past 3200 in my informal testing, but between 2133 and 2933, you will feel a difference in your system in Linux, just moving around the system and doing stuff, I promise you. So spend the extra money and get at least 2933 or even 3200. And if you get something like 3200 or 3400 or 3600 memory and your system won't post at that speed, that's okay. You should back off the memory speed but tighten the timings. And it turns out the Asus Crosshair Hero 7 does that automatically, which is a really cool, neat feature. So good job, Asus. It's like, it's like my spreadsheet. I did a video a while ago on a spreadsheet that's like a calculator where you can calculate your timings. And that spreadsheet is not perfect, but Asus has baked in that functionality into the Crosshair Hero 7. So good job, Asus, nicely done. About the only thing that did not really work well on Linux was sleep and resume. Now I had a lot of trouble with sleep and resume on the X370 chipsets, and it did seem to vary from board to board and BIOS revision to BIOS revision. Sleep and wake, like the low power management stuff in Linux, is still a little rough around the edges. I'm gonna recommend that you don't let the machine go fully to sleep. Now, um, with the MSI M7, I had the best luck. Maybe one in seven or eight resumes from sleep did not work. Uh, but so far, knock on wood, with the T6 BIOS revision, sleep and wake on the M7 from MSI seems like it's working way better than I experienced with like the, uh, the, you know, the SLI AC and some of the older X370 boards. So I, I think that's probably a software thing. But hey, you know, nice to have. 
Now, if you want to upgrade to the 2000 series CPUs on the 1000 series desktops, you could totally do that. You should check out our main channel at Level One Tech so that you can, you know, sort of see like the general hardware stuff. I'm trying to keep this short and trying to keep this about Linux. So yeah, it's it's really nicely done in terms of Linux support this time around. It, you know, if overclocking is not your thing, and I know that most people are running open source stuff, like you just like I just want to get something and plug it in and be done with it. And these are great for that. The CPU cooler in the box is great for running at stock speeds as long as the rest of your system has adequate cooling. It's not super loud. There's actually, if you get the 2700X, there's actually a little switch on the fan that'll let you toggle between low and high. And on low, it's not super loud. On high, it does get kind of loud, but it'll also let your CPU run faster. So these are really an easy button solution. If, you're, if you run Linux and you are looking for an, the easy button solution and you want really, really good performance, this is definitely it. I, I don't see any reason, like it, for a mainstream desktop setup here, this is, is really, really good. The clock speed, the stability, the performance, sort of the self, you know, the, the XFR2 features, it's really, really good um, for Linux and open source type uses. I've got more testing to do. That's that's my only real hesitation is like, you know, I always get in there and it's like, oh, when you're compiling GNOME, the whole thing crashes. But in a week of testing, super cautiously optimistic, really excited. It is a really nice refresh. Uh, you know, if you adopted the first gen, there's sort of that early adopter tax. I feel like the early adopter tax is basically gone at this point. So good job, AMD. This is a really, really solid option. I like it a lot. Come hang out in the forums at Level 1 Techs. I'm Wendell, I'm signing out and I'll see you there. Oh, don't forget to hit the little bell and subscribe and all that goodness too. Maybe, maybe leave some comments because it's appeasing the algorithm. I'm running Rise and Kill back here and the room has gotten 10 degrees warmer. Not really, I'm mostly joking. It's warmer because the, the boiler's on and it's not supposed to be cold today and it's like 40, it was like 80 yesterday. What's going on with the weather? All right. Um, let's see what else we got.